Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for November 10th, 2022. And I'm Andrew Johnson, the chair of the committee, and uh, I am going to ask our clerks to uh, call the roll uh, for quorum or do quorum check. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Vita. Present. Chugtai. Is absent. Vice Chair Koski. Present. Chair Johnson. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum for today's meeting. Uh, with that, our agenda is before us, and we have 12 agenda items, three of which are discussion, and I will begin by reading through our consent items. The first item is the 2022 Sanitary Sewer Availability Charge Appropriation and Revenue Increase. The second item is the 2023 Street Resurfacing Program Proze Project Designation, Cost Estimate, and Setting of Public Hearings. The third item is a contract and easement with Canadian Pacific for the 37th Avenue Northeast Street Reconstruction Project. The fourth item is the Metro Blue Line Extension Business Advisory Committee and Community Advisory Committee appointments. The fifth item is agreements with the Minnesota Department of Transportation for the Plymouth Avenue Bridge Rehabilitation Project. Item number six is Park Lane Neighborhood Street Reconstruction, the designation, cost estimates, and setting of public hearing. Item number seven is the capital project closeouts with appropriation, bond reallocation, and revenue adjustments within the city's capital project, enterprise funds, and declaration of official intent to issue bonds. Item number eight is a warehouse district live block event permit. Item number nine is the right of way permit fees ordinance. And with that, I am going to see if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments on these items. Otherwise, I will be moving all of these for approval. Council Member Wansley? Oh, no, I was turning my mic on. <laughs> oh, oh, in advance. All right, perfect. No, not seeing any comments or questions. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Uh, that motion carries. And next, we'll move on to our discussion items. And our first, first item today is uh, a discussion on the updates to the parking and mobility services fee and rate schedule. And I will turn to our director, uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, to see who will present on this item today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today, Dylan Freed, Assistant Parking Systems Manager, Traffic and Parking Systems, will be making the presentation. Excellent, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Freed. Hello, uh, Chair Johnson and committee members. Thanks for having me. As uh, Director Anderson Kelleher said, I'm Dylan Freed with Traffic and Parking Services. Uh, we're here today to um, present some recommended updates that we have to the parking services fee and rate schedule. So the first question is, what is the parking services fee and rate schedule? Um, this uh, fee schedule was just created last year. It ties together fees that we had set in a number of different places in different uh, council resolutions throughout many different years. Um, it bundles together a lot of the, all of the fees for our parking services generally. So our on-street parking, the municipal parking, uh, garage and lot fees, um, and impound lot fees. New this year, we're also incorporating the fees for the shared uh, bike and scooter program to this fee schedule as well. So one of the primary reasons we created this fee schedule was so that it was easier for us, more convenient and, uh, and transparent to do annual updates to any fees that we needed to address. So that's what we're, what we're doing here today. We have four areas that we've identified um, some changes that we'd like to make. Uh, most of what we talked about, most of what I talked about today will pertain to loading zone fees. So that's the bulk of what we're addressing. We're also uh, proposing the creation of an active use meter hooding fee for um, different outdoor space events that happen in the city. And then we're, we're doing a small update to the fee for our heavy duty towings. Uh, heavy-duty tows to just match what our contracted rate that we're paying is. And then we're incorporating the existing fees for the shared uh, bike and scooter program to this schedule. So, uh, so just a quick overview of our loading zone program of this in the city. We have 430 of these zones throughout the entire city as a whole. When I say loading zones, I mean a few different things, actually. So I'm talking about commercial loading zones, passenger loading zones, valet zones, limited time zones, and uh, special requested no parking zones. Um, 
about, we have 66 of them within metered areas, but most of them are in non-metered areas throughout the city, uh, 364. In metered areas, it's mostly, almost half of the ones in metered areas are valet zones, so serving hospitality at uh, hotels, restaurants, things like that. Quite a few commercial loading zones in metered areas as well. Uh, but a lot of the program is, again, non-metered areas, so we have about 215 uh, limited time zones all throughout the city and some of the small you know, business nodes and whatnot. And then quite a few no parking zones, which tend to be in industrial areas to help with turning radius for trucks um, getting in and out of industrial properties. So, so when, when a adjacent property or adjacent business wants one of these zones in place, they have to request it from us. And there's uh, an annual fee for that, to, for that to be kept in place. But there's also fees to have a crew come out and install the signage. So. Uh, most of the, the, the zones generally fall into two categories. Zones that are 60 feet or less generally just require two signs, so one sign at the beginning and one at the end of the zone. But the zones over 60 feet uh, require three or more signs, typically another one in the middle, so that's why you see the two different tiers there uh, based on the length. So the last time these, zone, these fees were set was in 1997, so it's been many years since we've actually gone in and updated the fees, and so that's... Uh, it's been a while, so we are seeing uh, a little bit of a, you know, a high percentage increase to some of the fees. So for a zone 60 feet or less, it costs you know, currently $300 for installation of the zone. To modernize that uh, with you know, modern labor and materials, we're proposing $700 to establish a new zone. And then the, the annual administrative maintenance fee is $100 a year for those uh, 60 feet or less, and that would increase to uh, $250 per year. And then for the, the zones over 60 feet, again, it's currently 400. We're proposing 1,050 to establish those zones. And then uh, having that annual administrative fee go from 150 to 375 a year. Valet zones are a little bit different in category. It takes a lot more oversight for valet zones because you know, they're a for-profit operation generally, and we have to monitor you know, which valet operator is licensed to operate it, things like that. Uh, so currently it's $600 per 20-foot parking space per year for a valet zone, and uh, we're proposing to, proposing to increase that to $1,500 per space uh, per year. So that is uh, the flat fees for zones, um, and those are paid for any zone throughout the whole city, whether it's in a metered area or not. Uh, for the zones that are in metered areas, there is additional fees to offset the lost meter revenue uh, for the zones. Currently, the way those fees are calculated is via a formula. So it's the hourly rate for that zone times the number of hours the zone overlaps the metered parking times times 80%. Just They roughly estimated their spaces are occupied about 80% of the time. That formula was also set back in 1997 when the, the flat fees were last updated for this program. And it, it mostly worked back then. A lot of the meters at that time uh, throughout the city were only enforced during business hours. So a lot of like valet zones and things like that did not have a lot of additional uh, lost revenue from the meter, uh, lost meter fees. But things have changed pretty dramatically uh, throughout our city. We've really um, expanded the hours uh, that require payment in a lot of our metered areas to help uh, manage demand uh, for evenings and weekends, especially in restaurant corridors, things like that. And so a lot of the, the meet lost meter revenue fees for these zones has really ballooned up, so you know, well into five-digit numbers that we're sending in bills to a lot of businesses. And so to help manage this program a little better, what we're doing is proposing three different tiers of flat per space fees um, for, for the, the ones in metered areas. It's still, the fee would be um, tied to the amount of time that it overlaps, the times that meters are enforced still. So the first tier is uh, five to 20 hours per week, it would be $1,500 per space, uh, 21 to 40 would be $2,000 per space, and then 41 or greater is $2,500 per space. Generally speaking, this is going to be a pretty significant reduction in the um, cost for these zones throughout the city. Um, so this, this slide kind of compares where, where we're at uh, with that, those per space costs for, for zones in metered areas. Today, the average per space cost for a zone in a metered area is $6,000 per space. And under the new formula, that would drop down to about $3,000 per space. 
So like under the current formula, you know, there's a few rare instances where it's about $500 per space, but some businesses are paying as much as $14,000 per space for some of these loading zones to be in place. Under the proposed rate, that, that, that range shrinks quite a bit. So the, the cheapest um, zones do come up a little bit, but then the max that anyone would be paying is about $4,000 per space um, anywhere in the city for these zones. The, uh, the graph below that kind of uh, is a comparison of you know, what they should be paying with the formula today versus what they would be paying with the new proposed formula. So the, the cost comes down quite a bit for a lot, of, a lot of businesses. There's a tier where it's mostly the same and there's a few at the end where uh, they might pay a little bit more under the proposed structure, but we would plan to reach out to them and explore options for altering uh, the hours of their zone uh, as we move this forward. All right, so moving on from there, uh, next was the active use meter hooding fee. So, so just last year, we changed the way we charge for uh, hooding of meters. It, it had previously been you know, the hourly rate times the number of hours in a day that the meter was in effect. That was a really difficult to communicate. We had something like 30 different combinations that it would cost to hood a meter um, anywhere in the city. So we changed that to a flat $25 per space per day. It's made the program much easier to communicate to people and it's been mostly successful but we have run into a few instances where outdoor space events were uh, getting much larger hooding bills than they had gotten before because you know some parades for instance or races would be held on days meters were not enforced and so their meter hooding bill is way less and so what we're proposing is that any um, event that is a ra receives a race permit a parade permit or a commercial block event permit would actually be eligible for this discounted $7 per space uh, per day hooding rate. That's what the, we set it at seven because that's what it was last year for days that meters were not in effect. So we thought that was a good place to start from. And this does align with some of the, the TAP guidance that we've had to, to um, incentivize outdoor space activations through the uh, pricing of right of way. Next up is the heavy duty towing fee. Um, the last time this was set was in 2005, so it's been a few years. Since then, the rate that we pay our contracted vendor for towing of heavy duty vehicles has gone up a little bit. So we're just proposing to match that. So it's a revenue neutral thing where, where it would just be a pass through to, um, to uh, folks who get their, their truck towed, so their oversized truck towed. And then finally is just incorporation of the shared bike and scooter program fees. We're not proposing any changes to those fees, just incorporating them into this fee schedule so that they have a permanent home. So. And that's all, that's all I had. Great, thank you for the presentation. Are there any comments or questions from committee members? Council, or uh, Vice Chair Kosky. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I just had a quick question. So the rates haven't been for the, some of the, zones haven't been updated since 1997. Can you just help us understand why the, not an incremental over time or why now, I guess this rate change? Yeah, yeah, it, it's unfortunate. I was digging through some of the documentation that was given to me a few years ago about this and they bemoaned in 1997 that they hadn't updated them for many years and they wanted to come back and start doing it more regularly. And so ironically, here we are 25 years later uh, coming to update them. Part of why we've identified doing it this year is we did just last year when we created the parking services fee schedule, we pulled a lot of those rate values out of ordinance, struck them all out of ordinance and said that they would be updated by council resolution. And so we identified a lot of these things that hadn't been updated for, for many years at that time. And we're just working to modernize it now. Essentially, the, the general fund that everybody is subsidizing installation of a lot of these zones right now, right? Because it costs more to put them in than the, someone's paying for it to be installed. So that's why we want to modernize the flat fees that haven't been updated in you know, a quarter century. For the, the lost meter revenue component, we want to modernize that because we get a lot of negative feedback, as you can imagine, from businesses that are paying upwards of twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year for these zones to be in place, and we see it as a barrier to a lot of other businesses being able to have these zones. So, 
the fees will come down substantially, so hopefully that will help with some of the traffic operations and just foster economic development around areas that, that would want them in metered, in metered spaces. So. Thank you. And just a follow-up question. So the fee increases for some of the zones are you know, some, double, some of them um, are even more than double. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to that uh, dollar amount? Sure, sure. Chair Johnson, uh, Councilmember Koski. We, we uh, are you talking about the um, installation fees or the administrative maintenance or both? Yeah, both of those. Sure. So we had our sign shop go and run the numbers on how much does it cost in labor for installation and material cost. And so, and not all installations are equal. Some of them are in concrete, some of them are in uh, turf. And so we kind of generalized about how much it costs for the labor and materials to do the installation. And that's where we landed. It was at the 700 for the, the 60 feet or less, or the, the 1250 for the, the greater than 60 feet. And then for the administrative maintenance, you know, we essentially um, took that same percentage, which both of these roughly fall in line with the cost of inflation since 1997 as well. And so we did look at that, but um, the overhead of running the program, you know, it funds several staff members to, to help monitor and uh, run the program as well, but it also offsets the cost to the general public for the use of this, the special designations in the public right of way for those. So. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Yeah, I was curious for the loading zones, we got this min of 500 to max of 14,000. What, what, was, what was the driver of the, that range? Is it the location? Do you get a discount for the total number of spaces? I just kind of wanted to understand that math a little bit more. Yeah, uh, Chair Johnson, Council Member Payne. It's confusing. That's why we're changing it. That's, it's we, we make mistakes, frankly, when we do the calculations sometimes. The way that it's set up is so that it's a formula. It's 80% um, of the total possible lost meter revenue for an entire year at this metered space. And so we have to calculate you know, how many hours a day does it overlap that meter? What is the rate at that meter? You know, because some of the zones might be, a valet zone might be in place from 5 p.m. to midnight. It might be a commercial loading zone from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so it's just kind of confusing to everyone and it was difficult to calculate. And so you have such a large range of the 500 to 14,000 because there's some metered areas that are only in effect from 9 in the morning until 5 p.m. Monday through Friday and 50 cents an hour. You have some areas that are in effect from eight in the morning until midnight at $3 an hour. And so it creates just this, there's a lot of different combinations of possible rates. And so, you know, we generally try to price our meters to, to match the demand for that area. And so um, that's why, you know, a few of these might be pretty cheap right now if they're in a very, they don't overlap the meter times very much or they're in a very low rate, but, but some of them are really expensive, and so that's why some of the, the businesses around downtown, you know, they might say, I, I can't afford uh, mm -hmm. that much to have a zone in place. And so that's part of why having this um, different way of viewing how we price the curb space uh, for a different type of curb designation, that's what we are going for, for this new updated structure, so. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from committee members? Uh, so first off, I, I wanted to, I'll add a couple, uh, I wanted to lift up the work of the sign shop and, and the team. I mean, it's a, a big job and there's constant changes. I mean, even today I saw a request uh, for a disability loading zone, for instance. And so I know that the whole team's been very responsive and really works closely with business owners in particular to really help identify what solutions are going to address some of their problems uh, you know where especially you think of like I'll, I'll think of for instance like a daycare in the ward in particular you know you've got hundreds of parents literally dropping off kids all at the same time and if you're in this urban environment where you have close uh, quarters with other local spaces that's not a lot of curb line and so to be able to uh, work with the sign shop, for instance, to have these quick turnaround zones, I mean, is literally essential mm -hmm. to some of these businesses being able to be viable, being able to operate in our city, and being able to provide those services to residents. So it's a huge service overall that uh, for the city that can really go overlooked. 
And I just wanted to lift up uh, the work and say thank you for that. Um, my one question is, how many of these signs are out there when I think about, uh, and I understand these fees, it's the, the, the installation part makes sense to me around the update to the fee. I think the administrative uh, annual fee it gives me a little bit of pause or hesitation if I'm being perfectly honest about it. Uh, $250 a year for that space in front of what might be a small commercial building seems like a lot. I get the understanding uh, of the overhead and paying for the, the position, so that makes sense. Uh, but how many signs generally are we talking here across the city? What's the scope of that administrative work? Yeah, for, for this program, like, um Currently, there's 430 different zones throughout the city that, that we have. Um, and so the, each of them is at least you know two signs, one at the beginning, uh, one at the end. And so, um, yeah, some, and more than that, if, if it's a little bit longer zone and, and requires several signs. And so, you know, we, <laughs> this goes to fund the work of all of the team that, that takes in these requests and vets the requests for new ones that come in. Um, follows up on ones that, of people who don't pay their bill or don't want their zone anymore or want some sort of modification mm -hmm. uh, for it. So, so there is just, you know, it has to go to fund the team to help manage all that and, you know, help to manage the billing aspects of it and, you know, intake and management of the zones. The same team also, um, as you said, the disability zones. So the same team manages all the installation and removal of disability zones uh, and disability transfer zones. Those don't, zones don't have a uh, fee associated with them. And so it does help fund some of those activities as well. So, Yeah, that makes sense. You know, just thinking future-wise on this, because I, I support this item today, but just as we're thinking about that, I think there's a couple components that come into play. I think to the degree that we might evaluate capturing out of the general fund potentially for the disability zones um, because those are an important service across the city as well but to have those come broadly out of the general fund rather than off of this specific fee may be a more equitable approach uh, to funding the related uh, proportion of work within the department uh, for that i think communication around and i think you've done a great job at committee I think communication out in the community as well around this change in administrative fees is going to be really important because I think if you're that that small restaurant and you've had that, you do a lot of pickup, takeout kind of stuff, you've had your two signs in place for the past 30 years, $250 a year, you might go, well, I don't get it. It's a metal pole. It's not changing. The sign hasn't been changed in 20 years and it's probably not going to for another 20 years. And so... What am I actually getting for that? And so I think helping them understand around the overhead and all of that, really the communication on that I think will be important. And then in the future as we're looking at this, my personal thought would be more on the installation fee up front and then less on the administration uh, fee year to year if possible. I understand that introduces some variability, right, um, over, over the program so that it's harder to tie in with the, those, uh, those overhead costs, but it might be a more, again, kind of fair, equitable way. But I support today's action, and again, want to just lift up the work of the team because it is really important, and it uh, really helps our city function, especially in that commercial space. So any other comments or questions from team members? Or team members. You got me thinking about the team so much. Mm -hmm. uh, any other uh, comments or questions from council members? Not seeing any, then I'll go ahead and uh, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Freed. I'll go ahead and move passage of this resolution, updating the parking and mobility service fee and rate schedule. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. That motion carries. And next we'll move on to item number 11, our presentation on the Minneapolis 2022 Vision Zero Crash Study. I'll turn to our director. Ms. Margaret Anderson Kelleher to ask who will be presenting today. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to, presenting today will be both Ethan Fowley, who is the director of the Vision Zero, or coordinator, made you director, of the Vision Zero program. He uh, is in the transportation planning and programming area. He's also going to be joined by Eva Goldfarb, who is an intern, an urban scholar, and is uh, working with Ethan in our TPP division. Excellent, welcome Mr. Folly. Thank you, uh, Chair Johnson. Thanks, um, Margaret and committee members. And 
So we're gonna, we're gonna present on both of these things together. So we're gonna take the next two items. We've got the, uh, our updated 2022 Vision Zero crash study first, and then we'll share the draft uh, Vision Zero action plan for 2023, 2025. I'm gonna provide a little context here first. So for folks who uh, in the public may not know what Vision Zero is, this is the city goal um, adopted in 2017 to get to zero traffic deaths and severe injuries on our streets. Um, and here's what we're talking about today. So this is a picture of our current Vision Zero Action Plan, which runs uh, through this year, and we're updating. As I do when I come here, I think it's just important to ground in why we're doing this work and the impact that this has on people's lives. Um, so I just want to take a minute um, to reflect on the folks we've lost in recent years on our streets. Thank you. Um, I just want to note, like, you know, this gives me a sense of urgency. I know it gives many of our team a sense of urgency um, to, to work to, to get this to zero, and we know the impact that this has on families uh, and individuals' lives. Um, I just want to recognize also the, the broad, our, our city-wide approach on this, and also our, our partnerships on this. So we have many city uh, departments in, involved. We have a a Vision Zero task force um, of leaders across uh, different departments. Uh, we also have, a, a, in the preparation of this draft action plan update, um, a technical advisory committee of, of staff across departments. And there are a lot of really great folks that have helped uh, in preparing what you see today. So I just want to recognize that. Um, a couple of folks in public works I just want to make sure to mention that aren't here are Kathleen Mayel, our, our transportation planning manager. Um, our traffic staff, um, Alan Klugman, previously Steve Mosing, and others on the, on the traffic team, um, and uh, Andrew Dergerstrom from our team as well in TPP. So, um, and then just also just, I think it's important, we're doing a lot, and I think we're, we're making a lot of progress. We need, you know, this is also about the public, right? This is about us coming together and just saying, like, the, those lives lost are unacceptable, and so we, so we I just want to recognize that also. Um, okay, um, now we're going to get into the crash study details. Eva, you want to come on? So, um, I'm really excited um, to, to um, introduce Eva Goldfarb, who's, as Margaret mentioned, joined initially as an urban scholar with us this summer and then uh, has been extended and is now a public works intern um, and has done really great work. Um, I, I think, so Eva's going to share on the crash study. I just want to note that, like, Eva has a spreadsheet for this that's so big that like almost every other time I open it and start to edit it, it like crashes my computer. <laughs> I mean, there's like so much information that Eva's been uh, really digging through. So I'm uh, really excited that she's here to present. Thank you, Ethan. Welcome to Scofarb. Thank you, Chair Johnson and members of the committee. Um, as mentioned, my name is Eva Goldfarb. I'm one of the interns with Public Works. And I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about the Vision Zero crash study, kind of why and how we went about it um, and what we learned from it. Um, so this was to build off of our existing framework from the 2018 Vision Zero Crash Study as well as the 2017 Pedestrian Crash Study um, and really to update the data in that for the coming years in 2023 and 2025 um, and kind of inform our priorities going forward. Um, this was also to get some additional analysis of factors involved in severe and fatal crashes. So this was done by individually going through over 800 MPD reports of fatal and severe injury crashes um, and looking specifically into the factors involved in those to get a better understanding of this issue. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank you again for having me today to speak on this and share this information. Um, as mentioned, I've been working on this um, since the beginning of the, of the summer as my time as an urban scholar, and I'm really appreciative to have gotten to continue that work over the past few months. Um, this has definitely come with its own challenges, and obviously this isn't a lighthearted issue. Um, and some of what we found is definitely not positive. Um, but I've learned a lot through this experience, through working with Ethan, and as he mentioned, everyone else that has put a lot into this work. Um, and um, yeah, I think this information can be really valuable going forward for kind of understanding the issue better and being able to um, know where to best target our efforts to continue reaching our goal and striving towards that goal of vision zero, of zero deaths and severe injuries on our streets. 
Um, with that being said, I'm going to go do kind of an overall um, kind of view of some of the major findings. Um, when we look specifically at traffic fatalities, we see that in the last few years, in 2020 and 2021, traffic deaths were really high in our city. Um, in 2021, there were 23 traffic fatalities. Um, that's higher than any other year shown um, since 2012. Um, you also see in the darker blue there, there were 11 pedestrian fatalities. Um, that's more than double what was seen in 2020 and the highest number of pedestrian fatalities since 1998. Um, traffic deaths have also spiked across the country in 2021. Um, the um, nationwide, there was a 31% increase since 2014. Um, while we see that fatal crashes have increased, um, as well as severe injury crashes in 2021, all other crashes were down 40% in 2020 and 2021 compared to previous years. Um, part of what we did for this analysis was looking specifically into where these crashes were happening. So these maps show pedestrian injury concentrations as well as the same injury concentrations for cyclists, as well as motorists and all modes combined. Um, all of these, if, you'd, if anyone would like to take kind of a closer look, will be available online in the um, crash study as well. And these maps kind of served as a basis for updating the high injury street network. Um, what we saw, similar to other years, was that a pretty small percentage of our streets account for a lot of the severe and fatal crashes. So there were nine of these that accounted for 66% of severe and fatal crashes in the last five years. Um, this was 112 miles. A little under half of that is within our city jurisdiction, um, as well as a fair amount with county and with MnDOT. Um, and as I mentioned, this was kind of to get a deeper analysis of where exactly these crashes are happening, what specific streets and intersections, to know where to target our improvements. And so with that, we saw 32 miles that had previously been identified as high injury streets that weren't this time, and similarly, 29 new miles. There's also a modal breakdown of high injury streets, streets for pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists. Um, as Ethan will talk about later, some of the guiding principles for Vision Zero are being data-driven and equity. Um, and so our transportation planners did an equity analysis looking at um, where crashes are happening in relation to income and race. And you'll see that areas of concentrated poverty where a majority of residents are people of color, which you can see in the map there in the patched areas, um, only represent 22% of total streets and 26% of the population, but make up 40% of severe injury and fatal crashes. With that, we looked at not only um, the areas that crashes were happening and the people that lived there, but also the people represented in these crashes. Um, and we see that once again, BIPOC communities are hit hardest by this issue. Um, Native American residents are most impacted by fatal crashes that includes both um, fatal pedestrian and bicycle crashes shown in the green bar, um, as well as fatal vehicle crashes shown in the gray. Um, similarly, black residents are overrepresented in fatal vehicle crashes. When we looked into um, the represent representation of um, users in comparison to their usage, we see that cyclists and pedestrians are overrepresented um, in um, severe injuries and deaths compared to the percentage of trips that they've taken. Um, for cyclists, this was slightly lower than what was seen in previous years, which means cycling has gotten slightly um, safer, but both um, remain more dangerous compared to the relative risks taken on by people who use cars. Um, we did kind of a deeper dive as well into the mode of travel and I'll explain the differences between these two graphs there. Um, the one on the left shows the modes of people that were killed or severely injured. Um, you can see a little under half were people in cars or trucks. Um, around 30% were pedestrians, which includes people walking, people using wheelchairs, as well as motorized foot scooters like um, limes and birds, um, as well as 11% using motorcycles and 11% being cyclists. Um, this graph on the right there 
shows all motorized units involved. So that's um, regardless of whether um, the people in those units were injured or killed. Um, it just gives us a sense of um, if there were any motorized units that we needed to be paying more attention to. Um, nothing really stood out there. You can see that there were um, 18 medium and heavy trucks and 16 buses throughout this time period. This is lower than um, that number statewide and nationwide. Um, so as I mentioned, we looked through these reports um, one by one, and one of the reasons we did that was to be able to analyze some of the contributing factors. Um, and when we did that, we saw that the top contributing factors for these crashes were drivers speeding, drivers failing to yield when turning, drivers running off the road, and drivers running red lights. Um, and of course, this will also be available in the crash study if anyone would like to look at some of the other contributing factors. From there, we looked at um, some of the top factors and how they've changed over time. We see that speeding has increased significantly, um, especially in 2020 and 2021, and especially when you look at fatal crashes. Um, this is similar with national trends, that speeding has increased across the country since 2020, but those increases have been bigger in Minneapolis. We also see that hit and runs have increased significantly in 2020 and 2021. And we also did an analysis of very reckless driving. Um, our definition of this was um, were crashes that had two or more contributing factors. Um, for example, if someone was speeding um, and also ran a red light or ran off the road and was also driving under the influence. Um, we saw that, um, again, there was a significant increase in 2020 and 2021, specifically when you look at fatal crashes. Um, last year, almost 80% of fatal crashes involved reckless driving. Um, and when you um, combine fatal and severe injury crashes, about 45% of severe and fatal crashes involved very reckless driving in 2020 and 2021 compared to 31% um, between 2017 and 2019. Um, there isn't really a standardized definition nationally, so it's a little bit harder to compare numbers, but we do know that reckless driving has increased nationally as well. We know that these types of crashes happen more um, at intersections and specifically at signalized intersections controlled by stoplights. We also know that they happen later in the day um, compared to the traffic volumes that happen during these hours. Um, in the previous crash study, the most amount of these, um, the highest amount of these types of crashes happened between 3 and 6 p.m. And we saw a slight shift that they're happening um, in these years a little bit later between 6 and 9 p.m. Lastly, we see that summer has more severe and fatal crashes, um, and this is also pretty consistent with national trends. Um, yeah, again, this will be um, available online, and um, before I switch it back to Ethan, are there any questions? Well, thank you. Any questions or comments from committee members? Vice Chair Kosky. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I just want to say thank you. That was excellent um, presentation. And I, I, this first time meeting you, but being one of our urban scholars and interns, I'm very proud of you to be able to give that presentation, not have notes, and know it by the back of your hand. So just want to say thank you for that. Thank you, Vice Chair Kosky. Appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Yeah, also, I'll say thanks. and. It's a, it is a really somber topic and, you know, just looking at the numbers and reflecting on, I think I've been bike commuting for over a decade now and just how many close calls I've been in and, you know, it's one thing to look at, you know, fairly abstract graphs, but the real impact of this work is, I think, really profound, so thank you. Thank you, you Council Member. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any, but I share the feedback as well from my colleagues, and it is really, uh, you know, you see that list of names that Mr. Fowley referenced right at the start, and we had a moment of silence for, and just some of those names are the same names as friends of mine, right? And so thinking about it in that way. These are somebody's friends, they're somebody's family members, and uh, those are 
each a person uh, and somebody who's loved and somebody who's a part of this community and that we care about uh, that is no longer with us because of these crashes. And so the work you're doing really does matter. And it's, uh, it's urgent and incumbent on all of us to advance this work as well, which I know we're getting into next with our action plan here, so not to steal any thunder uh, from that, but it's, it's really about preventing any more names uh, going on onto that list. And, uh, and so people can continue to be a part of our community and thrive. So thank you again for your work. Mr. Folly. Hello again, and thanks so much, Eva. Really great job. And thanks for all your work all summer and fall. All right, so now uh, into the, what have we got in the, the draft uh, Vision Zero Action Plan update. So this is for 23, uh, 2023 to 2025. Um, this is very much an update. So we're building from the current plan. Uh, we're building from the Transportation Action Plan, uh, which was passed last year. We're, we're building from the crash study here and other crash studies as well. Um, we are releasing this as a draft. Um, we've got a public comment period now through December 11th, um, and folks, uh, uh, we will uh, we'll be able to bring uh, those, you know, based on reviewing those comments, we'll bring a final version of the plan early next year uh, for council approval. Um, so some, uh, as I mentioned, this update building from our current plan, so just some highlights of what we've been working on with the, the current plan. And so I think most folks know a lot of these things, but we, we've lowered uh, speed limits on all city streets citywide. Uh, we created our Vision Zero Capital program that invests proactively in high injury streets. Uh, we have a new street design guide um, that has a big safety focus as part of that, um, and a lot of new capital projects coming on that are, uh, you know, that are reflecting those best practices and safety. Um, we have uh, new traffic, neighborhood traffic calming procedures and have received more than 800 uh, requests um, uh, for, for neighborhood traffic calming. Um, uh, and we uh, have supported a bill that was introduced this year on a speed safety camera pilot program um, at the legislature. Um, been working on that a lot behind the scenes as well. Uh, we, th this plan uh, allowed us to, to be, I think, the only entity in Minnesota uh, to apply for an implementation grant through the federal Safe Streets for All um, uh, um, and we applied for $30 million uh, there to, to further accelerate our, our work. So uh, there's a lot that's ha happened off of this plan um, and we're building off of that. Um, so process-wise, recognizing it's an update and we engage with people a lot on that last plan. Um, we, you know, people are busy. We wanted to take all that feedback and have that be the basis for this as well. Um, and then we did do a, a, a survey um, this year that helps inform some of that work, but um, we're, we're happy to get feedback on the draft, but um, we, we didn't repeat that whole process, which uh, included a lot of different engagement methods previously in coordination with the Transportation Action Plan engagement. Uh, we did um, have work through our Vision Zero Task Force and uh, Technical Advisory Committee for Vision Zero internally. Um, so our, just a couple details on our 2022 Vision Zero survey, which focused on particularly speeds on busier streets, which we, you heard from the crash study, particular challenge for us in safety. And so you, you see ge generally there's an appetite for more measures uh, to help achieve slower and safer traffic speeds on busier streets. I will acknowledge that I think folks that, this is not necessarily a representative survey, this is folks that we're interested enough in filling out a survey, so um, just acknowledge that reality. Um, we also uh, kind of get a, a sense here, there's a lot of information here, but um, these are some of the, the different treatments that we can consider for um, addressing speeds on busier streets, and just getting a sense of kind of like relative support, um, where we, what's a baseline for folks that are really interested in this topic. Um, so you can see here, pedestrian crossing medians, uh, very popular. Um, uh, so Eva mentioned this as well, but we, you know, we're just as our grounding here and what we're trying with Vision Zero is, you know, we put first that safety in human life uh, is our priority with this work. Um, with equity, I think it's both recognizing that we see disparities in severe and fatal crashes, but we also want to make sure as we're doing this that we aren't creating unintentional, unintentional uh, inequitable outcomes in other areas. I think we think about that a lot like in say traffic enforcement is one, one area. Um, we want to be data-driven, uh, coming from crash studies and other things. And then, you know, we want to share this out. We want to be accountable. We want to make sure that over time we're, we are able to make progress. Um, so 
this plan is broken into what we call like four different systems that we're addressing. Safe streets, which is about how we build our, uh, and operate our streets. Safe people is how are we supporting um, safe human choices out there. Um, safe vehicles, which is kind of limited city role and how do we make sure that we're uh, supporting safety there. And then safety data, which is really about making sure that we're sharing things and accountable and we have good data to inform our, our work. I'll just note that this is, uh, nationally, there's something called the safe system approach. We're very much aligned with that. Um, and I'm glad to see this happening kind of around the country, really um, taking a lot of what is kind of a vision zero approach. So some highlights. Um, we're gonna continue to make safety improvements on our high injury streets. Uh, you see the updated map. This is sort of the, the plan version of what Eva had shared earlier. Um, we are doing, you, you, you see a lot of the quick build improvements happening with the Vision Zero program, like on, um, here at, uh, I think it's 43rd and Nicollet, um, with the, the bollard improvements. Um, but we are working towards also like upgrading a lot of those to concrete over time. And that's the big focus within our, our federal Safe Streets for All application, um, which we'll hear back on in uh, January. Um, I, I do, you know, we are setting up to make sure that we're supporting, hopefully getting federal funding and being able to ac further accelerate this work. Um, we are also uh, looking to street designs and how can we reduce those dangerous speeds on busier streets. So I, you know, I, I mentioned this to a couple of council members um, in briefings, but we had a six-year-old who was killed by a driver going 96 miles an hour on Humboldt Avenue North, the city border, um, in June. And, you know, the driver was fleeing police, wanted for murder, you know, like there's a lot of things, but at the core, I just think about from a street design perspective, that driver was able to go 96 miles an hour down one of our streets. And we know that that is reckless. We know that people shouldn't do it. And are there ways that we can make it even harder for that to happen? Um, and because we know the tragedy that will come out of that. Um, and that's just one example. Um, and so we are, we are working, you know, this, this bottom picture here is um, from uh, after the reconstruction of Plymouth Avenue North, um, where we have seen significant um, speed reductions and really positive re results. Um, and we, you know, with some of the things we've done there. And so we want to make sure we're continuing to do more of those things that are working, but we also are looking to pilot some new measures, including a, a, on busier streets as well. And some of these, like we have to work with the state to kind of get rules to, to allow us to pilot these things. Um, but we, we are trying some of these things, including a, a, a raised crossing pilot um, on Monroe Street Northeast um, next spring and some other things here as well. So um, other important priorities, including our neighborhood traffic calming program. Um, uh, we're looking to, to, we add more specificity here about like trying to work with MnDOT on on speed limits on Mindot and Hinneman County roadways. And then also looking at, can we make potentially many roundabout works, but roundabouts work at more intersections? Because they're really a great safety device, but we have to kind of figure out, can it work in an urban environment at busier streets? We're doing a lot of traffic circles and neighborhood streets, but can we do that at busier streets? Um, I mentioned earlier our efforts around um, legislation for to enable a, a speed safety camera pilot program. Um, and I think what we try to outline in the, the plan here is just clarity that we're, we're trying to get um, state law to allow that, and then we will have a process to create a local pilot program. That will include ultimately a, a lot of things that go, you know, will go through the council and the mayor and, um, you know, probably some budgeting. There's just a lot of pieces there, and that will be informed by a lot of community engagement. So that'll, there'll be more to come there. We just don't know when we're going to get legislative authority, um, but we'll build off of that. Um, I will just note that, like, this has been just one core thing here is um, this has been proven very effective in a, a number of cities that have done it. You can see this, the stat here, um, up to 47% reduction in injuries. Um, we also have worked at the state level to make sure that our bill is built, building in to make sure it can be done fairly, it can be done equitably, that it can be done transparency, tr transparently, and that we can protect people's privacy um, through, um, through that process. And so we built a lot of those provisions into the, the bill that we've worked with um, partners at the state level on, um, and then ultimately we'd work to build additional details into kind of our, our local pilot. 
Um, I also want to just highlight some of the, the, the uh, realities around traffic enforcement. So um, the reality is, is that we've, uh, because of a variety of factors, traffic stops are way down in, in Minneapolis. Um, and we had started work, uh, or we also see within there that um, racial disparities in traffic stops are, remain um, persistent. And so, uh, and that's one of the, the pieces highlighted in um, some of the you know, Department of Human Rights investigation into the city. Um, and so last year, the um, Office of Performance and Innovation had started some studying around potential alternatives, uh, approaches on staffing and implementing traffic enforcement. That work was paused. You can see a summary slide um, on the bottom here of that work. Um, and, and what we're saying in this plan, we, we do want to finalize that study and, and really look to see what makes sense um, longer term for the city and how we uh, um, address and be able to staff um, fairly and equitably, but also like effectively traffic enforcement. Um, and we want to be able to focus on those most un uh, unsafe behaviors on our streets. Um, a couple other just details that you might be interested in. We get a lot of requests for marked crosswalks, as um, Alan and I talk about quite a lot. And, um, and so we do want to make sure we have a, a kind of a, a process and just clear like kind of we've done with the neighborhood traffic calming. Um, we'll have some other ones of those coming that's publicly available so folks can understand how we're making decisions and why. Um, we will also be, we, we get frustration sometimes like there's development or utility work happening and people are like, why aren't you doing a, something in coordination with that? And so we're gonna look at can we, can we create a program or, um, to support that potential collaboration better? Um, uh, Alan's group is working on a, a, a big traffic signal uh, rework and 2024 and 2025, and so we're gonna be having a lot of safety work through that, it's a big deal. And then some uh, things related to bicycle signals as well. Um, we also uh, wanna recognize this graphic here. Um, sh this is a national graphic looking at how you can get to zero, and about half of the pie nationally is really in like vehicle safety regulations at the federal level. And these are not like new technologies that don't exist. These are things that already exist and, and are being implemented in other parts of the world. And, and we wanna be able to support some of that stuff happening at the federal level, even though we don't have the ability to do that at the local level. Um, just to be clear, we're also prioritizing um, uh, some engagement around, you know, specifically uh, in equity priority areas that, for our work and while also moving quickly. Uh, to implement progress on Vision Zero. Um, we'll also have a metric tracking page coming um, and some other evaluation pieces, including of the, the recent speed limit change. So those are some of the highlights. Um, again, uh, we've got public comment um, through December 11th, and including an online open house. And then we'll be back here again uh, early next year. So with that, I will just uh, see if there are any final questions. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Let's see, any questions or comments from colleagues? Uh, Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, just the first question around um, the, the legislation that you're working on around the, the uh, camera pilot. Is there a way in which council members or committee members, we can see that, especially since I'm guessing this probably will be on IGR's kind of list of things that they'll be reporting back to us um, at Cal this upcoming Tuesday. So we'll love to see that legislation beforehand, um, if we can get a copy of that. Sure, yeah, the, uh, the bill we worked on this past session is linked actually in the, in the action plan mm -hmm. uh, and a summary of the bill as well, but I can make sure to pass that along to your office. Thanks, Council Member Wansley. Awesome, thank you. And then next question, so um, I'm seeing a lot of things presented here. They're really operational um, in, in nature. Um, and I know that some of these things we might have to codify through ordinance. So I just wanted to get a sense of if you could speak to some of the changes or additions that um, this council should consider as critical priorities going into 2023. Um, you know, I, I ask this because you know, this body has developed a work plan for the short term, but I would like us to be, you know, kind of cognizant of if there's things that staff has identified that we will need to codify into policy um, as we make these changes to make our streets safer going into 2023. Uh, Councilman Ronsley, um, I don't know that there are a lot of things in here that were, that are, I would say are like really ordinance um, specific, um, but there are a lot of, um, there are things that we see end up reflecting kind of in budgets. And so 
you know, I, I, we see that with the, the creation of the Vision Zero Capital program previously came out of the, the previous plan. We see that with the Safe Streets for All um, federal application that we came forward, which included a local match um, that you all, um, thank you, committed to. Um, and, and so I, I think some things will be there and, and um, on that side. And then I think on the, the traffic enforcement side, um, I recognize that a lot of those conversations will end up being at a policymaker level. And I think what we're saying within this plan is we're not pretending to have all the answers for that, but just like recognizing some of the information that we want to be able to provide um, for policymakers on that. Excellent. Thank you, Vice Chair Koski. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Thank you so much for this uh, information and love seeing all the different action steps. I just want to note one in particular, the coordination with utilities and other vendors and the communication around that. I, we, I get countless phone calls of, of project that they, a street that's been ripped, torn up, and then they are back the next summer, and then we get a phone call that is like, so wait, what happens? Why are we back here again? So I'm really grateful to see that. Um, and I know in our work plan, we talked a lot about that of communication. So I just want to recognize that um, having that in the work plan and con continuing that work is, is working. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Hey, Ethan. <laughs> Good presentation. Eva, you're really lucky that you get to work with Ethan. I worked with him for some years. He's pretty cool sometimes. Very energetic, though like a lot of energy. But thank you for this presentation. Thank you for the meeting earlier this week. A lot of this stuff we went over, but I did have one question about process. So you said that there's gonna be a public hearing that people get to weigh in on the, um, the action plan. That'll happen and you'll come back to us, but like what kind of things do you see changing or what's happened previously when people have um, weighed in? Is there like huge differences, small, like, like what have you seen traditionally when this uh, public process takes place? Uh, thanks for the question, Councilmember Vita. And um, we, so previously we did have a similar public comment period on our, our last Vision Zero Action Plan. Uh, I think we received about uh, comments from about 450 different folks. Um, I don't know if it'll be quite that many of this time, but uh, you know, just as a as a, a, a point of reference, we did end up making. Um, you know, generally we heard a lot of support for what we had proposed, uh, and we were uh, there were some detailed comments that we ended up making some adjustments, um, and nothing like big picture, like none of the big priorities, um, but some some detailed tweaks to kind of address that. So that's sort of what I would anticipate this time um, is. Uh, that you know we're probably because we've built it off of previous engagement and I and I think we've heard a lot of you know thing from that I think our plan kind of reflects a lot of that um, I, th I think that's probably true but we'll see through the this this comment period um, and so I would expect the comments or the potential changes to be a little bit more uh, tweaks than like overhauls but uh, we'll, we'll see through the process and what are you doing to reach, like I know you had a meeting recently in my world with a group of people, so what are you doing to reach out to folks to let them know that there is another step in this and they can weigh on in this process? Yeah, so we, um, Council Member Vita, we, um, so I, I think a couple things overall with the engagement on this plan is just recognizing that people most wanna engage when it comes to like, okay, you're doing something on my street? Okay, I wanna engage. Oh, you might be, you're, you're talking about traffic enforcement? You're talking about speed safety cameras? Like, we know that um, a lot of folks will want to engage on those details um, and at the implementation level, right? And, and so what you'll see is we focused on that within this plan as well, is like, that's where we're going to be putting more of our engagement resources is on those future implementation items uh, than on the plan itself. Because we know that overall, you know, the, the folks that, there are folks, a lot of folks that want to engage on a plan but it's fewer than want to engage on those implementation details. And so, but we are, um, we will begin out the word, um, you know, through all the city, normal city channels and, um, and uh, very much welcome and encourage uh, feedback on the, on the draft. So. Excellent, thank you. Any other comments or questions from committee members? Not seeing any, so once again, thank you so much for this work and the presentation to both of you. Really appreciate it. It's making a huge difference, so thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, not seeing any other comments or questions, I'm going to ask the clerk uh, or direct the clerk to receive and file both item number 11, the 
Vision Zero Crash Study Presentation and item number 12, the overview of the draft 2023 to 2025 Vision Zero Action Plan. And with no further business before us, I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you.